Good afternoon. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute virtually. I'm Mackenzie Eaglin. I'm a resident fellow at AEI and I work on uh, military budgets and strategy. I'm truly privileged this afternoon to be joined by the Royal Air Force's Chief of the Air Staff, Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston. We're also happy to have our live audience joining us and we hope that, that you will, as you listen and uh, learn, that you'll submit questions uh, for Sir Mike uh, through either email or using a hashtag on Twitter. If you're sending your questions through email, you can see here at the bottom of the screen, it's through hallie.coin at aei.org. On Twitter, the hashtag is AEI Airpower. And then we will take them and filter them and hopefully address them uh, during the audience question and answer portion of today's session. It's a, as I said, it's a pr privilege to welcome Sir Mike. He's joining us from Washington, D.C. So now it all makes sense about the time of day that we're doing this, although I'm sure you would have given us your dinner hour as well. But uh, the U.S. Air Force and the Royal Air Force, they have a, a, a deep and long bilateral relationship based on a storied and historic friendship for which we are very grateful. And having spent time uh, with, with uh, our current Air the United States Chief of Staff of the Air Force, whom I also address as Chief, and I will you too as well occasionally. Uh, I understand what I think he is thinking about quite often, and I suspect you're thinking about a lot of those same things. He is a man in a hurry to make a lot of changes quickly in um, different organizations and culturally inside the Department of Defense and around Washington. And so I think that, it, that uh, urgency is driven by a lot of things like technology, uh, uh, increasing capable threats to air power and air dominance and air superiority, which is no longer an assumption, I think, for, for any U.S. or allied nation. Uh, the challenges from small drones, swarming drones, command and control, and, and a wide range of new threats confronting us. So today to talk about um, uh, the recent United, United Kingdom Security Defense Development and Foreign Policy and the Defense Command Paper. Uh, Sir Mike has joined us today to give some opening remarks, and then we are going to go ahead and talk. Sir, you've been in this job almost two years, so this is a nice uh, time to, to come to AEI. We, we are pleased that you chose us to join here today. I won't go through the long list of your incredible uh, biography, but just know, just know that it is impressive. Uh, Air Chief Wigston, thank you. Welcome. The floor is yours. Mackenzie, thank you for that, that great introduction, and, and I'm just delighted to be back in DC after what's been a difficult year for all, all of us, every, everyone around the world. And that sense of, uh, of, of optimism as we go into 2021 about uh, things returning a little bit more to normal, because uh, to, to be able to come here and meet face to face with, uh, with General CQ Brown and, and General Jay Raymond to talk about our, our Air Force, to talk about the US Space Force, uh, to share that, uh, you know, our, our common ambition and particularly, well, with both Jay and CQ, our uh, our, our um, sense of um, urgency and sense of impatience that we need to get on with things. So the relationship between our, our great air forces and the space force are as, as strong as ever. And we've got a great, a, a great platform to, to build on going forward. And as you said, Mackenzie, we've just completed a uh, just over a year long uh, review of of uh, UK foreign and security policy and and our and, and defence policy, and it was a really a really deep rooted extensive review and and I'd like to make my opening remarks around uh, summarising some of the the findings of that review. The review took a took a view on the world. It took on a, a view on the world of today and on the uh, and, and, and the way the world is shaping up and. One of the one of the principal conclusions that came out of the work was that the, that the strategic context is ever more uncertain. The strategic strategic context is is one of instability, uh, its complexity, its dynamic, and the the the, the uh, defining condition of our time is is uh, is chronic instability, and that manifests it manifests itself in in threats, fast evolving threats. Uh, the um, the behavior of nations like Russia, increasing uh, aggression, recklessness, adventurism, particularly felt by the nations of, of Eastern Europe, our allies in, in Eastern Europe. We have to be clear-eyed about the, uh, the expansionist uh, uh, approach taken by China and what that means for all of us. 
we have to be uh, you know have to be alive to the the enduring nature of the toxic ideology underpinning violent extremism, which could could still has the potential to create acts of ha havoc and and terror around around the world. And then laced through all of that is technology and the increasing technological sophistication that's that's manifesting in threat systems, which are going to force a change in the way we operate because of their the level of sophistication, as I say, but also their proliferation around the world. So, so in all of that, uh, that, that, that more uncertain, that, uh, that quite sobering outlook on the future, the, the second uh, key theme that I would draw from the integrated review was that statement of the UK's place in the world and the UK's place as a global facing nation that, that is a problem solving burden burden sharing, burden carrying nation active on the world stage, determined to, to deepen uh, our, our influence through, through uh, strengthening international partnerships and relationships and, and recognizing within that, and, and, and most significantly for me as the head of the, the UK Royal Air Force, recognizing within that, that the, um, you know, that, that part of that that requirement to be active on the world stage is to secure and defend and promote the, uh, the, the, the open and resilient international order that we all rely on for our security and prosperity. And of course, within that, the, 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 the vital role of our armed forces in protecting that, that uh, you know, protecting our, our, our people, our homeland, our democracy, and and the and the and the the strategic importance of the armed forces in that, and that that was that was uh, demonstrated and communicated loud and clear by the additional funds that the review uh, awarded to the UK Ministry of Defence, amounting to an additional thirty three billion dollars over the next four years, on top of the funds we were going to get. So that additional funding gives us the opportunity and options around modernizing our forces, being ready and able to face the threats of the future. The final thing I would say as, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as, a, as the chief of the air staff, as the head of my air force is, is that one of the things that I was really pleased to, to that, that, that registered and was an essential part of how we uh, inputted into the uh, integrated review was the recognition of the utility of air and space power. And I think the demonstration to our political leadership of, of how uh, air and space power has enabled operations by air, land and sea over the last three decades, the, 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 the political choice, the operational choice that air and space power provides our government to act at speed, at range, precisely uh, on, a, on a global stage with minimal political risk and maximum political choice. Well, that, that, that enduring utility of air power was something that is, was threaded throughout the conclusions of the review. And it was, it, was, it was very reassuring. And I was delighted to see that it was recognized. But I would, I would finish on a, on, a, on a more sobering note before we move to your questions, Mackenzie, because at the same time, I would be, whilst I was pleased and, and I'm delighted to, sort of, you know, to talk about the utility of air power and, and what air power has enabled us to do over the last three decades, I, I point to, to a more sobering future where that control of the air that we have enjoyed, that has enabled all of that, uh, you know, the, the, all of that activity by, by land, sea and air. Well, that's no longer assured. We are going to have to, to uh, compete and, and contest the uh, control of the air. We are facing more sophisticated threat systems. We are facing uh, those threat systems proliferating more widely. And so one of the key things that's focusing uh, my mind, focusing uh, CQ, uh, General Brown's mind, is, is how we will continue to compete and win in a more contested uh, operating environment in the future. So I'll conclude my opening remarks there and I look forward to the, uh, to the discussion. Thank you, Chief. Uh, I... I think it's a remarkable victory. I, I think General Brown 
must be green with envy to have a review foot stomp all of the benefits of global air power and global reach and of course space power as well. Uh, he should be so lucky to, to have a defense review here if I uh, conclude those similar sentiments and to then subsequently raise budgets accordingly to continue to invest in what is not a birthright, as you said, but something I think political leaders have become quite accustomed to, which is, which is uh, more options uh, that air power delivers more bloodless options for uh, putting you know, our own forces in harm's way and just more flexibility, all of which air and space power provides. So kudos to you for, <laughs> for that small bureaucratic, significant, actually I should say bureaucratic and political victory. Uh, you know, you do, I, I do hear similar themes uh, based on what leaders here in the U.S. are thinking about in terms of the future. You know, just this past week, um, we had our central command commander, uh, Marine Corps General Frank McKenzie, uh, Ken, excuse me, Ken McKenzie testifying before Congress. I was able to only catch his House hearing, but he mentioned that one of the most worrisome threats to him is this uh, uh, drone swarming, small drone swarming, and how the U.S. is on the wrong side of that cost imposition strategy with you know precision munitions. I wonder if that's something you're similarly worried about. Yes, absolutely. And I think the experience um, faced by Saudi Arabia at the moment with attacks coming from uh, the, the Houthi regime in, in Yemen and, and elsewhere, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that has absolutely caught my attention and it's caught other, other air chiefs around the world's attention. So this is something that we're putting a lot of effort into. So sort of recognizing that technology is, you know, has once again enabled a, a new form of uh, warfare and, and ability to to attack us, and it's something that we've got to to do something about. So I so I do recognize, you know, I I, I share the general's you know perspective on that. That that's something that we've we've got to be alive to. But at the same time, I'm I'm not just talking about that in a in a defensive context, and one of the things that I am determined to to uh, introduce into service at pace is our own ability to swarm a network of drones that I will use to overwhelm enemy air defences as part of a, a, a combat air a, 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 a combat air uh, tactical formation, which uh, which will be a mix of piloted aircraft, remotely piloted combat aircraft. Uh, Un unpiloted autonomous combat aircraft and you know, loyal wingmen and and swarming drones and that's that's the mix of the future that we are looking at that that will start to happen this decade and will be the uh, and and within 20 years we'll have transformed the the, the nature of the the combat air uh, battle space in in and I've said it before but you know th this is as profound a change that we're facing now as I think the advent of the jet age did in the 1950s it's truly remarkable, and that's exactly where we are. In fact, you may be slightly ahead in terms of uh, thinking of next generation air dominance and sort of these formations of the future. We haven't, uh, the Air Force is starting to think about loyal wingman, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, bomb trucks, fuel trucks, auto you know, autonomously operated, of course. Um, but the, I, I, we're, we're, we've got some catching up to do. So if we could go back to, of course, your um, integrated review and your defense command paper uh, for a moment, what would you tell the audience are the most significant changes if you haven't already sort of made that clear? And then, uh, you know, how you're thinking it differently at all in terms, I mean, we've talked about in terms of the threat, but what would you want uh, your your counterparts here, and I know you're speaking with them privately, but I guess perhaps you know sort of their their leadership teams, right? Beyond the chiefs, uh, what would what would what's your like bumper sticker takeaway that you want them to know about this? So so I, uh, that's a, that, well, thank you for the opportunity, Mackenzie, because it, it's a, again a, another great question. But I'll just go back to something you said there about uh, about NGAD, and and actually. Um, you, you, you painted a very favourable comparison between we, where we are and where the USAF is with NGAD. But actually, I would say, no, we're, we're in competition and it, we're in competition in a good way. We're in competition as, you know, as, as buddies in competition right. because actually we're going through exactly the same thought process. We're looking at the same mixes. We're, we're doing or force mixes. We're doing the analysis. We're probably falling for the same uh, conceptual kind of bear traps and and we're able to sort of red team each other. So, so I think there's there's a you know as there has been throughout our rich history, there's a great opportunity to collaborate here. And I'm not talking about joining the two 
the two programs. I, I'm, I actually think that competition is really good at the moment because there's some big decisions coming up in four or five years' time as we go into you know, production and uh, and and you know, and build. But uh, but right now, as we get our heads around what technology allows us to do in the future battle space, I think this is a great opportunity for for, for some. For, for some traditional collaboration and competition between the United States Air Force and the Royal Air Force. But going back to the, the point of your question, the, um, uh, you know, what, one of the most, and if not the most um, significant outcomes of the integrated review for me was the government's decision to invest $2.8 billion over the next four years in our future combat air system. And that, and that is the, uh, if you like, the NGAD equivalent. Uh, that, that will be a mix of robot wingmen, of swarming drones, and a, a piloted fighter that we're, we're calling Tempest. And I need that in service by the late 2030s to, to replace our Typhoon fighter force, which is currently the, my, the backbone of, of my, my uh, combat fighter force. And, uh, and, and so the, the government's decision to invest uh, a, a significant amount of, of money over the next four years to get us to a point where we can make a decision about what that future fighter mix will, will look like was, was a, you know, a, a resounding vote of confidence in, in air power and, and in the Royal Air Force. So for me, a very significant moment and a significant moment for the British aerospace industry and for our uh, yeah, and, and, and for our for the opportunity for us to be a, a world leading science and technology power and and world leading in a in an important technological program. The second, I think, the second most uh, profound and most welcome outcome of the review for me was the decision by this government to establish a space command, which which we will be uh, uh, standing up and operating. Uh, within the Royal Air Force Air Command, um, but we'll be doing it on behalf of the UK Ministry of Defence and on behalf of government, and it will be populated with people from the Army and the Navy and and our, our civil service as well as the Royal Air Force. But the decision by the government to put an extra $2 billion over the next 10 years into our space architecture around our ability to communicate with our, ally, with our allies, most notably, of course, the United States, US Spacecom, United States Space Force, um, for us to invest in building our understanding and our awareness of what's going on in space, because we know that bad things are starting to happen in space. We see activities by countries like China, like Russia, which, is, which can only be interpreted as, as of malign intent, demonstrations of anti-satellite weapons, the ways they're, they're operating their satellites. And, and I think the, 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 the outcome of the review in terms of that investment in space is our government recognizing how dependent we are on space, not just within the militaries, but for all of us within our day-to-day -day lives. This is more than just enabling military operations. This is about getting uh, cash in the cash points, getting gas into, into gas stations, food on shelves, all of those things that rely on uh, a, a space services to, to make happen. Well, that's, that dependency is also a vulnerability and the UK government, just like the US government, is determined that we better understand what other actors are doing in space and then and that we, we configure ourselves to be able to protect our vital assets in space and then you know, if necessarily defend them. And, and of course, just like, just like on the surface of the earth, the best way to do that is with allies and with a, with a multinational collaboration coalition of, of like-minded allies who, who, who recognize the value of, of space, the benefits of it and the necessity for it to be free and accessible for all. And so that uh, the, the, the determination of the UK government to be a, at the, at, the, at, the, at the lead of that, that European space effort, I think was the, the, the other thing I would highlight as, as most welcome in the uh, as an outcome of the review. Yes, I, I have I've tried to convey often what you just said so brilliantly and eloquently, which is the role the armed forces play in really just securing our way of life, but also our prosperity. 
right? So, so much of uh, our ability, you and me, to communicate today is basically secured by air and space power and naval power, right? Because of the the undersea cables, which yeah. enable a lot of the internet, you know, precision timing and navigation, weather satellites, all of these things are thanks to our armed forces and, um, and contribute significantly. And the absence of that really just brings everything to a halt, not just for our the military, yeah. right? But um, but for uh, our our fellow citizens, yeah. So and it's, um, and, and it's and it's something, that, and it's not recognised widely by uh, our citizens. And you know that whilst that, whilst you could say that that's a um, that's a failure by us, perhaps to communicate it. But but equally, I'm quite pleased that we live in societies where our people aren't worried about external threats and 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 existential threats. And it's it's finding that balance between having a mature and sophisticated dialogue about what could happen, but without scaremongering like you see authoritarian regimes do to maintain control. You know, it's it's a it's it's a good thing about our societies that people don't worry about these things, even though it would be helpful occasionally if they did a bit. <laughs> uh, I just think those in uniform are it's hard to brag on themselves, right? So uh, but like, you know, the geotagging option in Instagram, right? That's again, these are the kinds of things that we can thank our air forces for for providing. And I know it's a luxury, but I can tell you when we would hear from them is if it went out, right? If the market stopped, you know, I mean, the the, 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 the our trading markets, right? Uh, yeah. In New yeah. York, right? All of this, they you need precision timing uh, and by, led by the U.S. and other air force. So anyway, if it's just a uh, I'll do the bragging for you then. How about that? And I'll try to continue. But I agree with you. I think there's a general fear fatigue here in the U.S. You know, 20, since 9-11, you know, Americans have really been worried about the wars. They, and then they were terrified of ISIS and, and, you know, in the mid 2010s and 20 teens. And now this global pandemic. And I, I, I do think this is something chiefs have to think about, which is exactly as you said, not to not to be afraid all the time. And I, I, I share your sentiment that I don't want everyone to be worried all the time. I, I think there's enough worry to go around. Uh, so if we could talk for, for a little bit, I know that one ambition, I guess, of, of the reviews is to be more present globally. But at the same time, you're confronting what our military is confronting, which is the need to divest legacy equipment. And when I was looking through the list, it's, it's extensive. Uh, in terms of what's being proposed or considered and you know our air force more i so than any other service i would argue has a difficult time doing that the navy to some extent but iron on the ramp is very different for a member of congress than a ship that say you know that that granted has a port somewhere here in the us but um it, it's just a, it's just a different political dynamic so yeah. how do you hope to be more forward and will that be Air Force or will it be shared across the services? So how does it change for the Air and Space Force being more forward? And then politically, is it, you know, how, is it different in the UK when you propose these divestitures or is it as, as challenging as here, but maybe for other reasons? Yeah, it's a great, great observation, Mackenzie, and it is different. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that I was, um, I, I took a as clear-eyed and unsentimental view as I could when I looked at my future force structure. And I, I identified parts of my force that are towards the, the latter part of their life cycle or where the opportunity to, to, to develop them into, you know, so, so they're fit for the modern digital battle space, the battle space of the future was limited just because of their architecture or, or the age of the platform. And, and I was able to, um, by, by identifying where I wanted to remove platforms and forces from my force structure, that gave me the headroom to, uh, to be able to invest and turn that into modernizing. So turn that into new platforms or, or, or new ways of, of delivering an effect. And I was, uh, you know, I was I'm, you know, I'm very pleased that I was supported by by my political leaders in in taking that approach and you know and and sometimes you know similar issues are faced in the uk where we hold where, where other factors force us to keep something in service for, for perhaps longer than it's 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 uh, it's relevant in the, in the in the modern battle space but i don't i don't suffer from any of the challenges that i think um the the us system faces when it comes to uh, its freedom to make those decisions. So I was able to 
as I say, take a take an unsentimental view on some of the platforms. And a, a prime example to me was around the, the C-130. And it's given decades of remarkable service. It's a fantastic tactical air transporter. But I have I have a choice now with the A400M uh, Atlas uh, transporter, which has greater performance, ha is a modern, you know, digitally enabled uh, platform that, that absolutely can play an, 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 a number of roles in the modern battle space in the way that the C-130, is, it's increasingly difficult to do. And that's, that's just one example of where we've been able to make a a, you know, a difficult, but but to my mind, absolutely the right decision in terms of modernising the force. I I am in no doubt that that the outcome of the integrated review for me has left me with a, with a much more capable and a, and a much more technologically modernised force um, at the, that we that will take shape over the next couple of years. Now, now the second part of your question was about that persistent engagement around the world because you're you're absolutely right that. That one of the things that we have, uh, you know, one of the outcomes of the review is that the UK will be more forward deployed. We will be looking to deepen our our uh, relationships and partnerships with with nations around the world. And and for the Air Force, for, for me, that means looking to build on partnerships in particularly in the Indo Pacific in a way that we haven't done for a number of years. And these will be these will be old relationships that we will have to dust off and and enhance or or enduring relationships like like with australia for example where we've got a great opportunity a bit of great sort of foundation to build on but to just build and enhance those those relationships and for me some of that will be around the f-35b there are operators out there like singapore like japan um, where we can work with them and uh, and and utilize the amazing capabilities of that of that particular platform with its uh, short takeoff vertical vertical landing there are other opportunities where we have a long standing uh, arrangement with uh, Malaysia Singapore Australia and New Zealand which again we will look to amplify and and take advantage of because i I'm, I'm in no doubt and and the 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 review was very clear that the that for for a globally engaged nation like the United Kingdom that depends on that open and resilient international system, the Indo-Pacific is of critical importance because of because of its impact on the economy, because of its impact on on the climate and and the resilience around climate change. It's uh, the the significance of freedom of, manu of, of, uh, of navigation, both by air and by sea in the region. These are all, this is, this is a really important area for us to, to demonstrate the values of international law, the values of democracy, and to, and to you know, stand up to, what, in, in effect, Ch you know, Chinese bullying of our allies and to, 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 to make clear to them that they do have a choice and amongst other allies like the United States and Australia, the United Kingdom is prepared to stand there as well. If you, if you wouldn't mind, sir, can you, um, uh, you know, in the Obama administration, right, the policy had shifted to a, a pivot to Asia. It subsequently was, it, it turned out to be not so much military uh, pivot, right? We, we didn't add much new uh, force structure in the region per se, but it, uh, through a variety of other tools of statecraft and economic uh, and pa national power, we sought to do that. And I know a term that's being used in the UK is a tilt. And is that because you're you have to worry you're worried about Russia at the same time you want to tilt? Uh, please, I just want you to say it in your own words for our American audiences, please. Yeah. So, so Mackenzie, you're you're absolutely right, and and I think that's for me as an as the, as an outcome of the review and this new. UK posture as a as a chief for me that's that's going to be the real challenge over the next couple of years is balancing that demand by my government to be more present and more persistently present in the Indo Pacific, but not in any way at the price of any any less focus on NATO. Uh, we you know, we we are the UK is at the vanguard of European security through NATO. We are um, the, the leading European contributor, and and that's you know, and, and that is something that that is a absolutely sacrosanct in terms of our force po posture and 
and, and how we operate. When you look at the behavior of, uh, of Russia in, on, on its, uh, where it borders Eastern European countries, when I speak to my colleagues from those air forces and what it feels like and what they, what they deal with day in, day out, you know, this this is a moment where where the uh, you know, the, the the unity and the success of the NATO alliance is as important as it has ever been. I've I've just deployed a squadron of typhoons down to Romania this this week, um, as part of a long-standing program to to support the Romanians in NATO air policing. But we'll be patrolling in the Black Sea over the next few months. You know, th these are the, the, we were in the Baltic last year. This uh, the, the the role of air power as a as reassuring our NATO allies and deterring a an increasingly reckless uh, Russia is a uh, you know is absolutely at the, you know, the 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 you know my my key role. And, but as you quite rightly challenged me, Mackenzie, I've now got I've now got to do a little bit of alchemy because I've got to uh, uh, make sure that I've that I'm I, I am generating enough air power so that I can make a meaningful contribution into the Indo-Pacific. And I, I, it's a long answer to your question, but I will, if I may, just bring you know, one more example in. So, so next month, our, our, our new carrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, is going to set sail from Portsmouth through the, through the West Atlantic, uh, sorry, through the, the, East, the, um, the East Atlantic and into the Mediterranean. Um, down into the Indian Ocean and into the West Pacific, and uh, and, and on board HMS Queen Elizabeth will be a, a Royal Air Force squadron of F-35Bs and a U.S. Marine Corps squadron of F-35Bs. So so and and the Carrier Strike Group will consist of ships from many nations. So I, I could not think of a better example of uh, air and maritime power coming together international and and you know being prepared to demonstrate that uh, you know that that part of the world matters to us and i think the you know and and the um, the significance of a royal air force squadron deploying on a royal navy carrier and the way our you know the way the, the first sea lord the head of the royal navy and i work together on this and the the way our teams have come together on this is a it's a really significant moment and it and it to my mind, it brings to life everything that we've said in the integrated review about how we are going to demonstrate our presence in uh, in, in the Indo-Pacific. I'm so glad you said that. Uh, I did, I hadn't been following it that closely. I'll be totally honest. And I'm such a defense nerd and an air power advocate. It totally gave me chills. That was really that's exciting. I cannot wait to hear more about that. So please. Um, come back to AEI after the deployment, uh, the strike group deployment, and let me know. Um, maybe we'll do a public or private roundtable because that's just really exciting. I want to hear lessons learned. I want to hear, uh, you know, force multiplying yeah. effects of, of the, the teaming. And I would love to hear, you know, just sort of an after action. So, or, or Yeah, well, Mackenzie, book, book me in. Okay. And I'll, 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 I'll see if, I'll, I'll try and bring the first Sea Lord along as well to, sh to, show, to show what good friends we are. Right. Okay. And then, you know, when there's room, you know, I'm always up for an embark. So great. <laughs> um, you mentioned uh, in your last answer that, you know, your government has asked for this increased presence, which I, I think is remarkable. I, I, I respect that point a lot because um, what I see in, in Washington too often is the lack of recognition, the the lack of awareness about the demand signal from policymakers being so high, you know, so I think they look around when various leaders testify and they're like, what do you mean the army's got a quarter million people around the world? We're not, you know, in these shooting wars at the height of them, like Iraq and Afghanistan. And yet we have almost just as many soldiers, for example, sailors and airmen busy every day around the world, keeping the peace. So I guess my question is again, you know, this, the durability of the ambitious, you know, ambitions of the review and the funding stream. You know, I just, there's there's a lot of um, not, I don't want to say financial pressure because we've been spending like drunken sailors to use a good metaphor uh, here in, in Washington, but some are predicting like a squeeze in a, a year or two on, on U.S. defense spending given the, um, the wild uh, free-for-all by our feds. So I guess I'm just wondering, are, are you confident in the durability of the ambitions and the funding stream in the next, you know, five-year window? 
Yes. So, so I, I the, the simple answer is I am, um, and that's been again one of the great outcomes from my perspective is that I've got a four year a four year guaranteed spending plan and a and a plan for the next six beyond that. Um, so, you know, subject to the next review, but but to have the certainty, you know, particularly, and you'll understand this, you know, I, I deliver complex programs that that straddle many years. And the and, and to, to have them blighted each year by annual settlements is something that I've lived through over the last years, and it, it is really corrosive, and it and it delays things and and um, it destroys value in programs. So I, I know I'm very fortunate to have a four year program, um, but but equally I am acutely conscious that that, that you know that, that money is still tight, and and I have to find efficiencies in how I operate to, to make this happen. Well, part of that was what I spoke about earlier, which was retiring platforms near their the end of their life cycle. And, and I took as a, I took the unsentimental approach that rather than just removing a few airframes or a squadron, I did, you know, my view was actually you just take the whole force out because then the whole logistics tail, the training, the the airworthiness, the, uh, the the industrial supply base, you 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 make a much more significant saving rather than just s slicing the salami as we as we say in the in the UK. Yep. But the the other the other area where I, I you know I know that there are uh, well I, I would I'd be careful to describe them as efficiency savings. Actually they're pro productivity enhancements. And it's around it's about how I generate and train my 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 my, my squadrons and all of my workforce, and by using synthetic training environments to a much greater extent, so that my precious flying hours and my precious deployments are not for training or just routine currency flying. They're for operational tasks or engaging with allies. Uh -huh. uh, you know, in large force exercises internationally. So, so my, so, so that if if you like my, 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 my flying hours, my reservoir of flying hours, every single one that I can is is delivering operational effect, whether that's actually on operations or whether that's through international engagement. And then, as much of my training and force generation, I will do in a synthetic environment. And of course, there are advantages to that as well because. Technology means that a the you can work to a much higher level of classification than you can do in a, in, a, in open air space where potential adversaries could well be watching you, uh -huh. and um, and and the actual level of training, particularly when it's networked, again, is is far superior to what you get on a day to day basis. Now, that's I, I know what I'm describing is an well, it's certainly anathema to. To my generation, who you know, who joined to fly, and it was, uh, you know, and and time in the cockpit was, uh, you know, was, was was all that mattered. Well, actually, I I think the the next generation we're going to have to approach certainly the the force generation and the the training in a in a much different way. But that's how we will enhance productivity. Hmm. I, I want to touch upon space briefly and then go to the uh, audience q and A's. I, I do not want to hog the moderator mic, although I, I certainly have enjoyed this so much that I could. So, of course, we have a, a, new, a new military service, the Space Force, uh, but we also have Space Command and other space entities. And so we're, um, I, I'd argue, kind of... Uh, still standing up our, our space force and fig and I think Congress has yet to you know receive it an, an authentic they're about to get the first space force budget you know from the ground up from the commander and so I guess uh, and, and I know of course that um, you're, you're standing up a new space command as well so if you could talk about your reasons for doing that and what you hope to you know what will be different um, I think that would be a great segue into our audience. Yes. So, as I think I said earlier, the, the the establishment of the space command and that investment by the government into space, is, for me, is the equal most significant outcome uh, for the for the for the future Royal Air Force. I'm um, uh, I, I, I'm sometimes asked if there will be a, a Royal Space Force, um, and my answer to that is certainly not now, but not never, um, because. I, I do see the increasing importance of space, and I do see it as something that we're going to have to expand uh, our our uh, operations and our investment in 
as a uh, you know as as a as a military and as an armed force to protect and defend what matters to us there and the uh, the 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 the, the uh, creation of space command the uh, bringing together all all elements of the uk space enterprise bringing in our commercial partners bringing in our academics and other parts of government into the organization means that the uk you know for the first time uh, ever has got you know has the opportunity to unify our space effort and there's a imp really important role for us in NATO, uh, standing uh, standing as a, the lead ally, if you like, or a leading ally um, with the United States to, to make sure that we are bringing a, a truly multinational enterprise together so that we're a better place to protect and defend what, what, re what really matters to us. So, so I'm really optimistic about the future for, um, for the UK Space Command. I um, I watch very closely what Jay Raymond is doing with the the U.S. Space Force, what, and, and and of course the relationship with the the U.S. Uh, Space Command, and uh, you know and it's absolutely something that I you know I'm I, you know I'm I'm privileged to be able to be a, a close partner to what Jay is doing and to follow his lead, frankly, and um, you know and we will be uh, we will be right there alongside the U.S. Space Force and U.S. Space Command for the future. It, he's got a tough job, but it's very exciting, and yes. uh, I, I think that's fantastic. Um, Chief, uh, I have a question from the audience I'd like to go ahead and raise with you. And by the way, the, we can use the term lead ally here. I think that's fair, right? Yes? <laughs> I hope so, right? So uh, you talked about healthy competition between, of course, the Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance Program. Uh, the Navy also has its version of a sixth generation fighter, as it's being called right now, although I don't think it, the expectation is, of course, that it, it has to be manned, and your future combat air systems. So are there any opportunities to benefit from potential co-development with the United States for common subsystems or components? Yes, I, 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 th I think there is. There, there absolutely is. And of course, that reflects the, the long history of cooperation and collaboration between our militaries and between our aerospace industries, and I, 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 can, I absolutely see that continuing. At this stage, we're in the concept and the the, the design phase, and the um, you know, and at, at this stage, there's a great opportunity to share some of our, our data points, to to share some of our conclusions, and to uh, you know, and to challenge each other, and to. Uh, challenge each other to go faster and further, and to challenge each other on some of the assumptions we make as well. So I think that that collaboration is is alive and well, and I, I think it was a really important part of of uh, developing our respective programs. Now, you know, this is the the conceptual phase. We will all it's it's very you know it's very timely that we're all in this similar phase together or in broadly similar time frames which means that come the key decisions, which will be in three or four years time, we're best placed to decide actually what is the best way to, to tackle this challenge. And, um, you know, and those will be, there'll be some pretty difficult uh, decisions to be made, complex decisions, um, but international collaboration will be a key, key element of that. I'm, I'm in no doubt. The only, the only bit I couldn't hand on heart say right now is, what that outcome will be sure. um, because there will be uh, national options there will be us options there will be european options but somewhere in all of that is how we as a as a group of like-minded allies will uh, be defending our skies from you know from the late 2030s well if i could just take a moment to, to ask you then to brag on your industrial base and you know are, are you hopeful that uh, you know a lot of the problems you're trying to solve can be, you know, be solved primarily through, you know, United Kingdom companies and technology and thinking and, and are you seeing, you know, experiments and prototypes and research and development plans or science and technology plans that, that are, are giving you hope for what might come? Yes, yes, I am. And, and we've already joined. So it's even, even now that the UK, it's not just a UK program. Uh, Italy and Sweden have, have already joined us and they bring some great technologies and some great depth of academic research to to the um, 
to, to the uh, development phase as well. But I, but I, I'm you know, one of the things that I'm very proud of is the UK, the depth of the UK's science and technology base in our universities and in our in our science labs. The the, the UK Prime Minister you know, talks about the UK as a science and technology superpower. And when you look at the things that come out of our, our labs and out of our universities, you can understand why he, he uses that kind of that kind of language. It's part of the reason that we're the only tier one partner on the F-35 programme, the JSF programme, right from the outset. That 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 15% or so by value of each F-35 that's built that that is um, that, that that is uh, that goes into the UK is as a result of our technological input right at the very start of the program. So I I, I think the you know our rich tradition of uh, of collaboration, industrial collaboration, academic collaboration, well that will continue into the future to both of our advantage. So if I may ask, not you don't need to give us specifics, but you know in terms of kind of what brought you to town obviously we're, you know things are reopening but i'm also wondering if we could expect um an update on the shared vision statement of 2018 between the royal air force and the u.s air force if that might have been something you guys talked about yeah yes yes it is and um and we we actually recite because um since the last time the shared vision was was signed the u.s space force has come into being and um, and there was an opportunity to reframe it, recognizing the the U.S. Space Force and recognizing how uh, uh, how CQ, J, and I want to take our services forward and and the um, and and our uh, and our uh, you know, shared shared vision, shared uh, agendas of, as to how we will achieve that. For me, the um, you know the opportunity. Whilst I've been able to have a number of conversations with with both CSAF and CSO over, over the last year, and um, and uh, and and I, I saw Jay in person shortly after he was he became um, CSO and after the establishment of the, of the Space Force, the opportunity and you'll understand this the the opportunity just to have a, a face to face meeting to have to physically. Be able to well el elbow bump CQ <laughs> to to congratulate him on uh, his appointment as CSAF. It it felt long overdue, um, and it just uh, it just brought to life the you know the value of the relationship between our, our three services and um, you know and how important it is. So so uh, you know the the shared vision is, is if you like the the headline umbrella statement of our relationship and our intent but what really matters is what we're doing on on operations in the middle east right this minute what really matters is the collaboration amongst our our science and technology teams or our or our trials teams what what really matters is that we've got royal air force men and women uh, working across the united states air force as exchange officers you know, it's uh, what you know. I've got uh, space uh, space experts in Vandenberg or uh, or in, in, in and in Spacecom. You know, these are these are the things that bring our three services together, and and the the shared vision is just a just a, a, a text that bring, that 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 brings a puts a sort of as I say an umbrella across that. Yes, indeed, uh, General Brown. And I spent some time together in person a, a month ago or so. And um, as part of the Air Force Associations, uh, one of their conferences, and I agree that it's it's just nice. To, it's it's a different um, it's different when you are in person. Uh, things the dynamic yeah. is just so welcome and, and different. And so next time when you give us that update on the historic deployment coming up, uh, we you and I shall meet at, at the American Enterprise Institute and together in person and hopefully with an audience. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk about just perhaps in our remaining few moments left. So you, you mentioned command and control as a big priority. And of course saying, you know, we need a lot of uh, new investments here in the US similarly. And that, that can mean just so many different things. It can mean hundreds, if not thousands of programs. Um, the Air Force has, a, the US Air Force has a very ambitious, uh, you know, networking effort underway. Um, the chiefs are trying to get aligned as in, you know, the, 
our Air Force chief is trying to get our Army chief and our Nate, you know, our chief of naval operations to all agree so that they don't all run off in different directions and then find in five years nothing can talk to each other, right? Uh, so, you know, a shared and common network, essentially, that's that's survivable and protected and so many other things. So it's just hard. It's just hard, I think, for, you know, the general public to understand command and control, how essential it is to the kinds of operations our militaries conduct, right? It's really what sets our militaries, I think, apart from, from so many in, in the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, the essential nature of it. But like, in, in your mind, what does that mean? How do you modernize command and control? And then I, I want to ask about data and information after after that, please. Wow, that's um, that, that should be the question you asked at the start because I don't I don't think I've got the hour required to answer that one, Mackenzie. But um, but I, I think I'll, I'll start by saying that I absolutely recognise everything that you've just said in terms of where the pitfalls might be about um, uh, not having incompatible systems and and above all how important it is for the the battle space of the future. I I I, I sort of. Um, yeah, there is a number of ways that you can sort of bring to life why it is so important. And I think, you know, that, you know, one of the things that we are going to have to get our heads around is how we defend ourselves against hypersonic missiles and uh, you know, a, a, a sort of barrage of hypersonic missiles, where 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 seconds in a decision making in a detect and warn and decision making chain is is too long, where it will have to happen at the speed of light. So there is an absolute imperative across all domains that, uh, you know, and and you, know, you don't need me to tell you the significant, the, the, how fundamental the role of space is in this. Across all domains that we are on the same, you know, common defense uh, information architecture where every every sensor on every person or platform in the in that battle space is, is feeding data which is sorted and, and, and uh, and turned into useful information that's either flagged up to users or is uh, made available to be pulled by users to, to fuse with what they know, to build their essay, to enable them to make decisions faster than an adversary and then execute those decisions. Now that's, that's fundamentally what this is about. And it's difficult and, and it's technologically challenging, but this is, this is the technological challenge of our of our time this is the one we have to get right because if if we don't get this right we will be fundamentally disadvantaged in the future battle space and we'll be fundamentally disadvantaged against our our potential adversaries and uh, the uh, you, you talked about the importance of bringing the US Marine Corps the Navy the US Army and the US Air Force and US Space Force together well I completely agree. It's exactly the same in the UK. But what we've also got to do is bring the UK and the US and all of our allies into this as well. So this is a really significant challenge. I think there's a uh, there, there is a need to upskill people like me uh, and you know and, and um, other senior, senior leaderships in our organisations because we uh, we are not as fluent in this as we need to be. We need to change some of the. Uh, acquisition uh, processes in our organizations to be much much more match fit for the digital age and we need to prioritize the technological investment into these systems to make sure that we are ready for um, for what is uh, you know what you know, for, for the for the command and control and the digital command and control we need so there's definitely work to be done on this one and this isn't the time for um, this is this is not the time for tribal rivalry. This is the top. This is absolutely the time for collaboration. Absolutely, I agree. And you brought up one of the big three threats. I think of the future. You brought up you know the threat of hypersonic weapons. Um, but I I put alongside that you know artificial intelligence and five G. Something I know the UK is thinking about as much as we are. Um, partly because we're telling you to. Um, or so I, so so um, so uh, what what are your what's your other um, so hypersonics, and what's the other two threats then? Artificial intelligence, or you know, technological capabilities um, that the races we want to win, I guess. Hypersonic weapons, yeah. artificial yeah. intelligence, yeah. and 5G. And, um, and you know, what I see uh, fundamental to all of that and what you said about command and control is this, is data and information. I think, and you know, we see um, countries like Russia, constantly using military deception 
to manipulate data. And I think our own defense department is, is behind the times on this. And so are you also thinking, and, and so much of AI is co computing, math, storage, and data, essentially. Uh, are you thinking about military deception and as part of command and control, as part of winning the artificial intelligence and 5G, uh, are you thinking about information differently going forward? Yes, yes, we are, and and again, in 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 our sort of doctrinal publications now, we talk about competing below the zone, and um, you know we we are uh, you know we we are we we are held to a higher standard of truth, so misinformation is more difficult for us, and that's why and that's where below the you know that that's why our adversaries exploit uh, activity below the threshold of response because they know that we have a higher legal and moral and ethical threshold of response and they and as I said they exploit that exactly. so so by being alive and alert to it and alerting our people and our public to what misinformation means um then 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 we will be uh, you know better able to to respond to it uh, and and it's something that we must do there are schools in Scandinavia or, or education systems in Scandinavia where right from the first years out of kindergarten, children are being told to how to, uh, how, you know, how, how to discern what is misinformation in social media, right? And, and you know, I think that's remarkable that, that Scandinavian governments take those initiatives. But it also reflects what they've been facing over the years that yeah. that we've been, in, you know, sort of ignorant to. And and these are the sort of things that I think our societies are going to have to be more alert to and potentially be ready to embrace. Mm -hmm. So Mike, you have been very generous with your time. I want to give you the final one minute to just say anything that you didn't get to say or anything if, you know, uh, I mean, I know General Brown's already heard from you, but if there's anything you wanted to say to anyone here in the U.S. through me, please, uh, the floor is all yours before I thank you profusely one more time. Yes. So, well, thank you, Mackenzie. And it's been a great conversation. And there was, there was one thing I wanted to mention, which is why I, uh, came back at you when you mentioned three threats, but but actually I'm, I'm going to sort of say something which um, you know which is probably uh, ten years ago wouldn't have been said, and certainly when I joined the Air Force was not a concern of mine. But I but I do think as an Air Force chief, the environmental threat is something, and the climate threat is something that we are really going to have to deal with, and, and I think it's timely because of some of the announcements in Washington this week that that actually chiefs like me, global chiefs, are going to have to come to terms with is how we operate our forces in a sustainable way. And that's and that is everything. You know, that includes the fuel we burn and how we you know how, how we introduce more synthetic fuels or different ways of propelling our platforms all the way through to our estate and and our industrial supply chain and working with our with our industry partners. And one of the things I'm going to do later this year is pull together like-minded chiefs to start setting what our level of ambition is for uh, for us for, for net zero air forces. And as I say, it's it's entirely counterintuitive. It's something that I, I don't think I would have considered ten years ago. But I, from a UK perspective, I've got a you know it's, it's very clear to me what my political. Uh, direction is and you know my, my political leadership is is demanding that we move to net zero that the British public is demanding we move there and and actually the the young people joining the Air Force today this is one of the things that excites them about my my plans for the future Air Force that that we will be an Air Force which will be environmentally sustainable as I say it's a it seems a crazy thing for a chief of the air staff to be talking about but I but I want to start that conversation with my fellow global chiefs and um, and we will we will come back to it but um, as I say I'll, I'll leave you with that thought it's been a great conversation I'm delighted to be in in Washington and um, and I'm, I'm glad that we've already been booked for a reshow so <laughs> that's, that's, that's clearly a good that's a good combat indicator and I know it is indeed, sir. And uh, I know right where we're going to pick up, which is on this climate question, right? All of the angles from how it's going to impact future mission to war gaming, to concepts, to sustainability and yeah. consume, you know, our militaries are large consumers of energy yeah. and particularly the United States. And we are thinking through those questions right now, maybe a little bit further behind than you, but but definitely at the forefront 
of our chief's minds as well. Their chief marshal, Sir Mike Wixon, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for coming to AEI. I know you had your pick of where to go. And we, again, look forward to welcoming you in person uh, uh, later this year or early next year. Thank you, sir. And thanks for our audience. Thank you, Mackenzie.